But I want to show you this. This is a very special bike because they only made it for two years in the United States. And the Ascot is, it comes in two variants. This is the VT500 and there is another version called the FT500, which is a single cylinder. This is a V-twin. It's a very small V-twin and it's quite a special bike and I think you would agree with it. This bike and the CX500 make some incredible bikes and I've seen a lot of guys with this particular bike that are converting it into scramblers. They're doing these resto mods with a lot of interesting things. It's the same thing with the CX500. With the CX500 from Honda, people have been doing a lot of cafe racers and the prices on the CX500 has been going up. On this Ascot, and Ascots in general, their prices have been steadily increasing. This one I bought relatively cheap for about $500, but it was a non-running Ascot. It is a phenomenal bike, and the best thing about it is that it's a shaft drive. It's a very light bike, so it only weighs like 420 pounds, and it's more than enough power for most uh, commuting and pleasure riding. It is a very old bike, and I have done a lot to it, including reupholstering the seat, which is something I've never done. So let's go ahead and look at this bike and look at all the details it has. It is a phenomenal bike. Up front, I put a steel braided brake line that improves braking. I try to keep most of my bike stock, but it's got a two piston brake caliper up front with a very large rotor. You don't need a lot for this bike because it, it's not a very fast bike. The forks are very conventional. They do have some rusting in the legs, but they don't seem to be leaking. I will be doing a fork oil change on it eventually and looking at the seals. Another very interesting thing about this wheel and the front and the rear wheel is that it's an 18 inch wheel. So that creates a lot more stability while riding. A sport bike in comparison is a 17 inch wheel, most of them. My Yamaha Super Tenre has a 19 inch front wheel, which is only one size higher than this and a 17 inch rear. This is an 18 both front and rear. I kind of like that. The increased stability is really much greater. I have a square headlight, which is very unconventional for bikes of this age. Most bikes had a round headlight, but the Ascot, it's got a very strange look. The headlight is high up and rectangular. It's very high quality. This is glass. You know, this is something that manufacturers have stopped putting on bikes. And down here, you have a cover, and it really is just, there's a bolt down down here then you remove it and it's got the horn right here and it's nice that they put like these slats here so you could actually hear the horn i think it's a very interesting uh, type of thing that they have done it's very simple i love the simplicity of these bikes and just by removing one bolt you can just pop it all out one of the few things i've done is replace the blinkers that came with the bike normally i'd like to keep stock everything stock but these are lighter and they were much cheaper than the blinkers that come on the bike. And the blinkers are very large. They're like these rectangular ones. Now, in hindsight, I wish I did get rectangular ones because they would have gone with the design of the headlight and everything. And I think uh, for $13, getting four blinkers is not bad. These are LEDs, so they also take some of the load off the bike. Up here you have a very familiar engine from Honda. This is a V-twin, very easy to maintain, very easy to work on. And of course it is carbureted. The carburetor on this bike when I got it was pretty bad and I had to buy a new one. The old carburetor was so bad that it locked the, the butterfly and it couldn't move. So that was the biggest expense of this bike was getting a new carburetor. Surprisingly, removing the carburetor was difficult because there's not a lot of space in between these two cylinders. When you're looking at this bike, very simple, it's very elegant. I like the bikes that you can actually like look at the engine. Spark plugs, I replaced the spark plugs and they're very easy, one on this side, one on the other side, and you can just pop them out. Uh, valve adjustments on this are surprisingly easy. So valve adjustments, there is a cover here and one on the other side, and that's how you check the valves. And they use the lock nut sort of um, adjustment so you don't have to get chims. 
To check the oil on this bike, it's rather simple. It is here, it uses a dipstick. I wish it used the sight glass, but I guess back in the day that was not really used. The way to check it is on the center stand and you put it in, you do not thread it, and then you just check the oil. And the oil is uh, the correct, correct height. Large rear brake pedal, which is kind of nice. That's more of a cruiser thing than anything. The rear brake works surprisingly well. All these pieces that Honda has made is meant for uh, durability. They really last a very long time. This is all the original stuff. So I did have to get a new front master cylinder, but the other one was so clogged up. If you watch my previous videos, you will see like so much gunk inside of the old master cylinder. And it was just so clogged that I thought, and the line, also the brake line was just so filled with gunk. It, you could actually get like a spoon and remove the liquid. It wasn't liquid, it was a gel at this point. The radiator cap is right over here. All you have to do is remove this uh, piece of plastic that's a little bit off right now. And you can see it right over there. Very easy to reach. The color on this bike is not exactly black. It looks black, but it's blue. And it's a very popular blue. The only color it comes with the VT500 is a very bright cherry type of red. This one comes with a very nice sturdy rack. You would think that somehow, yeah, I think a lot of the Ascot owners will remove this rack, but I kind of like it. It's sturdy, it gives it a lot more utility, and, but I think a lot of people that get this bike are gonna be using it for mostly kind of showing around. It's become such a collector's item but it is nice that it comes with it. I don't intend on removing it, and, um, but I kinda, it does affect a little bit of the looks. Remember, this bike, when it was new, was not meant to be the top of the line. This was a budget commuter bike. So behind this cover, you can just pull it out. It's, uh, it's just like these little uh, tabs. There is your air box, and the air box was in pretty bad shape when I got it. I got a new uh, filter in there. Oh, holy cow. The foam is, it's a powder now. This mimics the other side, the uh, rectifier. Hidden behind this plastic, there is your coolant bottle. The exhaust is in surprisingly good shape. It looks like it was uh, down one time or two, probably dropped right side drum brake. And this is very easy to, doesn't really need a lot of maintenance, but the shocks though are a little bit rusty and I kind of feel like they should be upgraded. The suspension on this bike is very budget oriented and it doesn't really perform very well. But these shocks, even though they're rusty and kind of ugly, they function extremely well. And look at this, some attention to detail that Honda has. Right over here, they put like a little lip for the rear shock to go underneath. They didn't need to do this. They could have made this a little bit wider, but there is a really nice angle, this line that kind of goes around the shock on both sides. Yeah, I really love that the shock and the plastic are completely one unit. They look really good. It's a good fit and finish. It's a good design. Whoever thought of that should get a raise look at the design of Hondas, they often have like the swooping lines. So you can kind of see this plastic go like this. It's an S-curve. It's uh, what a lot of artists do with figure drawing and figure models. They look for the S-curve of models in the basically looking at the spine. So if you consider that, this bike does have something very similar to the human body. This is a frame. If you touch it from underneath, it's metal and it's under the seat, so you can kind of pull up on it. It's good if you're put, you know, bringing the bike up from, if you drop it, you can use this, a grab rail for your passenger maybe, so you can grab it over here. It's, if that's the case, and I wonder if it's missing something. Oftentimes, they could have a little bit of a gra grab rail, but I don't know, because this bike didn't come with it, but I assume this is your passenger, grab rail and also a way for you to lift the bike onto the center stand. Very simple tail. It's typical of these 80s bikes to have something so large. And 
I did put the LED blinkers back here. The tail lights and everything work, but one thing you could do is just replace them with LED bulbs. To remove the headlight, it's just these two screws and it just pops right out. And of course you do have the LEDs. Bikes these days, the lights are a little bit more inter integrated into the plastic. They could have done a little bit better job integrating it into the tail section, but this is a typical thing that <clears throat> motorcycle manufacturers in the 80s did. Very rectangular, very square. And of course the LED bulbs have a license plate bracket with a light. That is what you need for, for being legal. The rear tire, even though it's an 18 inch, it is very thin. You could replace it with something bigger, but often these uh, commuter bikes came with very thin tires. This is one of the best things about the bike. The motor and the engine on this are phenomenal. Shaft drive, 500cc bike, very rare. And I did change the oil in it. It doesn't use up a lot of oil. That's your drain, that's your fill, that's it. Very simple. It's a very similar style to a lot of bikes. Even the ST1100 that I had, had a similar style, even the Casey and everything. You even have a helmet holder. I've had many bikes, I've never used a helmet holder, but it, it's there in case you need it. This bike is just a very simple commuter bike. It's a commuter bike that now people are starting to realize that's all they need. They usually come with center stands. I've seen guys that have removed the center stands for re decreasing the weight on them, but I really love a center stand on a bike. That's perfect. It also has a kickstand, so that's a good, great system. The filter on this bike, it is just simply one of the most massive. It's so big that I was able to put a 1991 Honda Accord filter in here and the filter from the Honda was actually smaller than the one that came with the bike. And of course, this is a six-speed transmission. It's interesting that it's the usual six-speed type of thing. Six-speed though, when you hit the sixth gear, it actually gives you an overdrive and it goes from one N, two, three, four, five. Instead of saying six, it just says OD, overdrive. Something very interesting. This is a tool pouch for your documents and tools. And look at that, it's got, that's a great idea. I love that they put this in here so you can put your registration maybe, your tools, but it is a toolkit, a lockable toolkit. And I just love the fit and finish and the ideas behind some of these bikes, these older bikes. On this side, you have a rectifier. And on this side, you have a rectifier plastic thing that looks like the rectifier on the left side. You have your clutch, and it, it's not a hydraulic clutch, it's a cable clutch. Most shaft drive systems have a hydraulic clutch as well. This is cable, and it's a little bit of a hard pull. I did lube the cables, but it's a little, it's a little bit soft. Right here, you have your high beam, high beam and low. You don't have a passing button. And here is your blinkers. The middle is off, left, right. It would be nice. Eventually they started putting the self-canceling push button style, which is better. And then down here you have your horn. And here you have your choke. This is like a choke and richer. On this side, you have your kill switch, kill and run, your start button, and of course your throttle. It is nice that Honda did provide us with mirrors that were rect rectangular instead of round to match the headlight. For the speedometer unit on this Ascot, you have a very interesting, it's very symmetrical, and then you have a gauge here in the middle. And then you have some more dummy lights here with the addition of the key going over here. Now the key is a little bit of a troublesome thing that I do not like, but when you look at the speedometer here, this bike only has 16,000 miles. This is the trip meter. To reset it, you have a knob over here that you rotate. In the middle, you have your temperature. And then over here, you have more lights. And then here is your tack. It is nice that they gave us all of this. And then over here, you have like a high beam indicator. You have your OD. Your OD is basically your overdrive signal. I don't know why they, they even decided to put that in there. Nowadays, you could replace this entire gauge with a very thin 
gauge that's electronic and digital, but I decided just to keep the same one because I kind of like bikes to look the same. Here's the problem with this, with the key. If you put it here, one thing that you're going to find is that the key and the, the speedometer unit is just so tight that it's a little bit difficult to, to turn sometimes. And if you have additional keys here, it's going to get stuck. So let's go ahead and start up the bike. You might need to give it a little bit of a choke. This green is typical of the bikes. You know, they made it very 80s. There's a lot of bikes that even still have the same design cue. If you're looking for your fuse boxes, your fuses are located here and you can get them through just two Phillips screws down here and they pop out. Very good looking bike, I think. You know, one of the problems that this bike is just becoming a little bit of, of a cult bike. People that have this bike just are hanging on to it. The prices for these in good running condition are almost what they were when this bike was new. Very difficult to understand that, but because the limited amount of bikes that were made in 83 and 84, this bike has become quite a collector's item. Just look at how high that headlight is and how small it is. It looks kind of that movie Johnny Five, the robot. You can kind of see a lot of the industrial type of design in the Honda Ruckus as well. Not a very bright headlight, but it does work. You can see the color is a very dark blue. This is a very popular color. This is the more rare color for the Honda Ascot. Another very interesting thing about this bike is that the kickstand is really up in the front. Normally you have a kickstand right about here, but they put it really high in the front. Sitting on the Honda Ascot is a little bit different. If you're used to modern bikes, the first thing you're gonna see is that the gas tank is really low. And when you look at my thighs, it's almost like level with my thighs. Normally a motorcycle will have the gas tank much higher up here. Modern bikes have the gas tank almost like a belly size, like right over here. My Yamaha Tenray, I'll show you in comparison. It is absolutely different than this. This will feel like you're riding something completely different than most bikes. If you're just used to bikes in the 2000s and even in the 90s, you'll see a big difference in the gas tank. The gas tank is also very small. It's got a very limited range. I believe it's a 2.5 gallon gas tank. It might be a little bit off, but it's, um, it's very small. Normally three gallons would be an average gas tank, so two point something is really not very much. The seating position is very strange because you're like really kind of like high up. It just feels like you're riding a very small bike. It's got a very narrow profile. So everything about this bike it, in physical dimensions is very, very small, very narrow, very short. It's very low to the ground. Even though I'm on the center stand right now, you can look at my position. This would be the normal riding position. It's very comfortable. There's no windscreen, so it does hit you. Um, the handlebars have a very high and back bend, so it feels almost like a dirt bike in a way, it, but it feels absolutely like very normal. And of course, you do have quite a bit of foot peg to kind of put your leg on, your foot, and then you have a very large rear brake, which is more reminiscent of Honda Shadows than it is of a standard commuter bike, but it's still something to be appreciated on this bike. Very easy position. It, the type of uh, handlebar is narrow. When you look in comparison to most bikes, they give you a little bit of a wider handlebar, 
that's a very easy mod because this handlebar is something that you can get from most dirt bikes, but very easy to, to ride. Now, this is not a, exactly a fair comparison. Just to tell you the difference, both of them have center stands. To put this one on a center stand is a lot more difficult. Ugh. This is a 600 pound bike. That's a 400 pound bike. You can see that the difference is quite big. When you look at the gas tank here, it comes up so much higher. If I sit on the bike, that's how high it, it is, right over here. The Ascot is like down here, and it feels like you're riding like this on it. The handlebars on this are just so much wider, so these bikes are gonna be much more different, of course, but the good thing is that both these bikes are just as reliable. Shaft driven, 1200cc, shaft driven, 500cc V-twin. Two cylinders, two cylinders, but bikes, what I'm trying to illustrate is that bikes, modern bikes are just so much bigger and we have lost touch with the good things that motorcycles have. And that, I believe, is a much more fun bike to ride than this, surprisingly. This is good in certain ways, but that thing, if you were to get something like that, you would have just as much fun as you would with this. Probably even more fun. Not to mention that the Super 10 Ray is extremely large. It's extremely, like, wide. This one, I believe, makes a much better bike. Let's go for a spin on the Ascot. It's so much more upright. It feels like I don't even have a bike between my legs. Yeah, the first thing you notice with the Ascot is the seating position. It's like very upright, very small, very short, very low to the ground, and that tank, that gas tank is just so hot. It's just so like low. You know, every other bike has got a very high gas tank. For some reason, modern bikes have gas tanks all the way up to here. I don't know, I, I like it. I like the sound of the bike. I like the style of this bike. Look at that, it just sounds so good riding around a garage. Look at that. It sounds great. It's a great sounding engine, man. You know, for a bike that was only popular in 83 and 84, I think this is a very worthwhile bike. And don't understand why it wasn't really popular. But this Ascot has got a fascinating history. And there is like this thing now that people are starting to get back into these old 80s bikes. Because you know like the more you ride these 80s bikes the more you realize that they were very well made extremely well made and the Ascot was named after the Ascot Park in California not the Ascot the tie but this bike was never popular it's you know it's one of these bikes that just sat in showroom floors for a very long time. People did not buy the Ascot. They bought the CX-500. The CX-500 at the time was the one that most commuters and most people that looking were looking for a utility bought. And the Ascot, soon everybody realized that it was not a high seller. So they discontinued it. I don't know if you're interested in building bikes this would make a great scrambler it's got all the nice things about it this bike is becoming a cold classic it's like all the hipsters they went like oh yeah yeah I want the CX 500 gonna turn it into a cafe racer and now all the hipsters drove up the prices of the CX500s but they missed this gem you know I was actually surprised I didn't realize what this was because it's so rare 
and I was looking for a CX500 because I thought, man, it's a V-twin, sideways, very interesting. And, oh, dirty, dirty little corner here. And I was looking for a V-twin sideways because I thought it was kind of cool. Then I had a shaft drive. And this was a time when Honda was building bikes with shaft drives. Like a lot of the 80s bikes had shaft drives. When you are building bikes with shaft drives, it just costs more. It costs more to build, manufacture, a chain and sprockets. It's much easier and you make more power. So on paper even sounds good and then you decrease weight, but you lose something. You lose that nice, reliable, very easy to live with sort of This bike is fun to ride. Listen to the, her purr. Listen to her purr. Look at this. Sounds so nice. Man, that is a great sounding bike. Great sounding bike. Yeah, this bike still sounds pretty darn new. And I think what's going to happen is that the hipsters are going to ruin it for everybody. They're going to probably buy this, these bikes. And one thing I don't like, it seems like I don't, don't like a lot of things, but I don't like it when they take the bikes and they basically just make them something else. I don't know. I like stock bikes. To me, a stock bike always looks the best. Because it's a glimpse of the past, you know, it's uh, it's what like 1983 was. This was a bike from 1983. If you start to modify it, yeah, it's cool in a different way, you know. I like the resto mod because it keeps the bike looking stock. And it still improves the handling or suspension. Sure sounds good, man. Well, guys, we are nearing the end of the ride on the Honda Ascot. And, man, this bike is really sorting itself out by itself. It's like I barely have to do anything. So this bike is extremely interesting. It was named after Ascot Park in California. Not Ascot Park. It, as in ties, it's Ascot Park in California. But the bike itself never raced at Ascot Park. They, Honda had other bikes that they used for that purpose. This was built more as a commuter bike and an economy sort of bike for, for people. And I think a lot, this bike was not successful because they only brought it here for 83 and 84. The more popular one was the CX500. That's why this one, the prices on these are so much higher because they are much rarer. And it's just as good as any Honda Shadow. It's got the VT500 from the Shadow, so it's very reliable. It's got interchangeable parts with the Shadow. And it's a great bike. If you can get one of these cheap, go out and buy it. Uh, the only issue is that finding parts for it has become kind of difficult. But you put this in your garage and you hold on to it for a couple of years and it's just going to appreciate in value. The prices on these 